We're on tape two, side one, and continue, continuing uh, living the gospel more generously, our formation series on deeper prayer, deeper spirituality. And we were discussing uh, book one of the Ascent of Mount Carmel, chapter five, paragraph five, went into paragraph six, ended up into paragraph seven, and now we're into paragraph eight. And again, we were there where God commanded that the altar of the Ark of the Covenant be empty and hollow. And, and in that Ark of the Covenant only was placed manna from heaven, the rod, the staff of Moses, and the law, the commandments. The only appetites God permits and wants in his dwelling place is the desire for the perfect fulfillment of his law and the carrying of his cross. Sc <coughs> Excuse me, Scripture does not teach that God ordered anything else to be placed in the Ark where the manna was. He wanted only the law and rod of Moses signifying the cross to be placed there. <coughs> A person who has no other goal than the perfect observance of God's law and the carrying of the cross of Christ will be a true ark, and he will bear within himself the real manna, which signifies God, when he possesses perfectly, without anything else, this law and this rod. And we were continuing on how not to be frightened that the fulfillment of God's law in marriage is to love the spouse and love the children, and God raised this natural good to a sacrament. So many people want to misinterpret, uninterpret, or avoid this doctrine regarding these appetites. When you approach it through generosity, it's kind of the back door. You begin to open up their heart. You begin to open up their mind. And they drop their natural inclination to be frightened of this topic. And you'll be able to penetrate deeper in. And to just be able to give them a flicker of the beauty of this doctrine. Which is simply, it's a doctrine of happiness. It's a doctrine of, of love. And it's your father who's trying to lay that egg in the nest of their intellect, will, and memory. It's very simple, very easy, and he's, he's not going to hurt you. He wants to help you. So we're going to continue on. So we are then talking about St. John the Cross describing what will limit our generosity to God. He goes further and he labels this limitation appetites. And he describes and explains the, what these appetites are through the use of the term cistern. So cisterns are holes in the ground. In the Old Testament, in the time of Moses and Abraham, holes in the ground were called cisterns if these holes were used to collect water. As water was collected, it was expected the level of water would rise. Now, they weren't wells. Wells are sources of water. These cisterns are not sources of water. They collect water. And they collect water in an area where it is usually a desert, where there is no water. And they are used to water others. So they are used as a source of water for those who have no water. Although they are not the source of the water that's in them. So there are holes in the ground used to collect water. As water was collected, it was expected the level would rise. So your soul is like a cistern. It has the capacity to receive God, to hold God. When you fill up with God, your level of God should increase. You're able to grow, progress, change, and draw close to God. Do you see that? You're not the source of God. You're not like a well. But you are like a cistern. God comes in, and you have this huge capacity to receive God in your intellect, to receive God in your memory, to receive God in your will. And you can hold God. And when you fill up with God, your level of God should increase. You're able to grow, progress, change, and you are drawing closer to God. Now, it became apparent in dealing with cisterns that they lose their capacity to hold water and they lose their contents. That was observed in the Old Testament. That cisterns would lose its capacity to hold water, lose its context, contents. Number one, defects in cisterns were discovered. The diagnosis was made when the water level did not increase or the cistern went dry. The diagnosis was that leaks were occurring. These leaks were what were causing the inability of the, of the cistern to act and function like a normal, healthy cistern should. This cistern would not fill up beyond a certain level, and it was discovered it was a leak that was causing that water to stop at that level. Or worse yet, if the leak were in the bottom of the cistern, the water would entirely be eliminated from the cistern, leak out. 
water spills out where leaks occur. And that's clear in cisterns. Now, how does a soul leak or spill out its contents? Well, it's through its appetites. How do you diagnose this? Well, when the level of the contents fail to increase, or when the soul goes dry. So, as you are filling up with God, and you don't follow through on that continuum, day by day by day, you're not filling up with God. You're filling up with God, but He just kind of leaks out. Or he totally leaks out and your soul goes totally dry. Now remember, let's do a, the anatomy of your soul, what it looks like. You have three faculties for our purposes. The intellect, the memory, and the will. The intellect is the seat of truth. Where your intellect will fill up with truth. Your memory is there to fill up with happiness. And your will is there to fill up with goodness. So as God's operations are beginning to take over your operations and fill your faculties up with the truth in the intellect, happiness and the joy in the memory the will uh, have goodness test it and can you understand let's test this to see if you can understand the existence of these through these three faculties uh, so you know that they'll all exist god can dwell there and they can leak out one i want you to consider that i'm thirsty right now the understanding in your intellect of how I am thirsty right now is an intellectual thirst. You have this idea of a thirst that's in your intellect because you're beginning to understand that I'm thirsty. Two, I want you to recall your thirst, the last time you were thirsty. That thirst is in your memory, the memory of that thirst. Now, listen to this tape again when you were actually thirsty. That thirst is in your will. This is a very elemental way to show the existence of these three faculties, your, your intellect, your will, and your memory. They do exist, and they can all have a thirst. Well, they can also have God, and they can also leak God. Knowing that, pretty simple, that, and, and the diagnosis has always been there, John of the Cross has laid it out, and he's the doctor in this area. The question is so obvious. Well, why do people not plug up their leaks? For the leaking that's taking place from these three organs of the soul. If God constantly is filling us up through the sacraments, if we are receiving him in a relationship through prayer, and he's infusing himself, why don't we just all get together and plug up our leaks, and the problem would be solved? Well, there are about four reasons that I can think of why people don't plug up their leaks leaks from these three organs of the soul. One, they may not know how. That's obvious. Two, they may reject what is taught on this by St. John of the Cross and his Nada doctrine. It can be very frightening to souls. Entire books have been written about reinterpreting what the doctrine really is to avoid the consequences of the doctrine by individuals that I believe don't fully understand the doctrine. Three, there's consent to ongoing appetites. Four, accepting a false exaggeration of Pelagianism. Now, the first three, let's go into. This fourth one is something we can talk about a little later on. Uh, it may require more time and space than we have here. Those who may not know about how to do it, you can tell them. Take them right into St. John of the Cross, Book 1 of the Ascent, Chapter 5, Chapter 6, read that. Two, if they're going to reject what's taught by St. John of the Cross and is not a doctrine, not certain how to proceed. If they consent to ongoing appetites, you work with them and you support them. And you, you work to help them overcome that. Let's go forth and kind of describe the problem a little bit deeper by going to St. John of the Cross. Now, let's set this up before we go into St. John of the Cross for a second look at his uh, beautiful teachings there. I've introduced you again to the anatomy of the soul, revisited that, the intellect, the memory, and the will. That was a very well developed, it was important, it was developed on the first series of tapes, addressing the Bible, Bride, and Holiness, your first six months. I'm assuming that you've had some association with the anatomy of the soul. I've introduced to you the concept of how you can have a thirst in all three of these uh, faculties of your soul, organs of the soul. Now, this misunderstanding of what St. John of the Cross tells us can be a cause for rejecting this, this teaching, this is where I've seen it come up at over and over again. And I want to suggest for you, uh, think about 
how all of these three faculties right now, you could be thirsty for a Coke and hungry for a burger, or your favorite food and your favorite beverage. Have both a thirst and a hunger. Now, consider this. When you have that thirst and that hunger, it's totally consistent with that thirst and hunger in all three faculties to have a spousal kiss, hug your child, have a friendly hello to your neighbor. These can all be done while you are thirsty or hungry. That's self-evident. Now, you maintain your orientation to God with your appetites by desiring Him among your activities of loving well in this world. That's classic Thomas Aquinas. We discussed that, I think, in a prior tape. You know, you maintain your orientation to God with your appetites. You walk through to Him with your appetites by desiring Him among your activities and loving while in this world. Now, the angels did the same thing. They never ceased in their orientation when they were in this world serving our Lord. There, they were constantly oriented to God and His will. When they came to humans, united to God in service to man. Okay? The service that God is asking of us, it, it will never, never cost us, I should say their angels, their service to, uh, to us, to pe individuals, humanity, never cost them their relationship with God. So again, consider this thirst and this hunger you have for the beverage and the food. And do this at a time when you want to hug and kiss your spouse or your children or your family without receiving your, you, you know, your food or your beverage. God simply wants to move that thirst and that hunger from your favorite beverage and food to himself. That's the bottom line. That is it in a nutshell. God wants to move your appetites off of things onto himself. And then you complete and fulfill his will, his divine law. And he can govern and conserve and maintain his creation with your operations because he's divinized them. And pe this is not heavy lifting stuff. This is the Nada doctrine. It's not frightening when you approach it from the aspect, from this angle here. I, I, I'd like to hear from you. If you think, if, you, if this is frightening, write me. Tell me, call me, and tell me that I need to take a look at this. This approach has worked in Michigan. It has made headway in Michigan. These appetites that you're to give up are not going to take you away from your family, are not going to hermitize you. They're not going to ask you to be antisocial. They're totally consistent with the duties you have in life. And in fact, it's the obligation of the secular order Carmelites to implement this teaching, to make it better understood, and to make it uh, more known. And in fact, the Millennium message, Novo Millennio Nute, of our Holy Father, by guiding the entire church, inviting them to take as worthy guides, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross, the Holy Father is exalting this teaching. And so you should know it. And you should have a comprehension of it and command of it. I don't think this is heavy lifting stuff. Now, we're going to go a little bit further on into St. John of the Cross, a little bit th further on about what Jesus says to us in Scripture and tells us about appetites, about leaking cisterns, about people failing, rejecting, uh, not and, and consenting to ongoing appetites. In a moment, I'm going to take a water break here. All right, now, I've snuck you into the Nada Doctrine. We're on the flip side of it, talking about generosity, because I think it makes it much more presentable. And it's worked for us here. That's the most important thing. We're doing what works. I think it's... Uh, I've presented the doctrine at one level. I now want to take you over the same doctrine a little bit deeper. We're going to go back to John of the Cross. We're going to go into the Bible. You now have a vocabulary. And I encourage everyone to take a look at St. John of the Cross, Book 1, Chapter 5, Paragraph 5, and uh, reread that. We're going to be looking at Exodus 34, 3. And we're going to be talking about it. And again, the goals for this portion... Now, this presentation, the key concepts are four. And I'm going to add on. I'm going to do a little repeating, but I'm going to take it a little bit further on. Don't, uh, uh, don't be frightened by this information. Hang in there. You're going to find out that this is all going to come together in a beautiful, beautiful way. 
The goals for this talk, the key concepts are one, filling up with God will cause you to be more generous. Two, prayer can be experienced as intimate communication with God. Three, experiencing God as intimate communication is consistent with good family life. Four, God can communicate more than words. He can communicate himself substantially. Now, we're going to go into a no-leak situation. We described just briefly what it is about a leaking cistern that appetites are to the soul, what leaks are to the cistern. Let's go into a no-leak situation as we begin to develop uh, this whole doctrine regarding leaking cisterns, being generous, and appetites. And remember, the key here is sacrifice and love. All right, a no-leak uh, situation. The keys to this generous heart began to be given in the Old Testament. The background of the Old Testament has concepts and vocabulary that you'll want to understand. The heart of the Old Testament where God was present, we're looking for where God was present. We find it in the Ark of the Covenant. No leakage of God here in this Ark of the Covenant. No spilling out of things divine here. And God's presence was without limitation or constraint. He would here communicate face to face with Moses. Now remember, again, prayer is an intimate communication with God. Do you see how the Holy Father for the new millennium is asking for you in your prayer, let it progress to intimate relationship with the with this Holy Spirit, leading ultimately to union with the Trinity. Do you see how you have this Ark of the Covenant? You have that no-leak situation. In the Ark of the Covenant, there was the law of God. There were two stone tablets with ten commandments. There was the rod of Moses, and there was manna from heaven. Just talked about that. God substantially exists here. Now, when God begins to communicate, beyond this Ark of the Covenant, the risk of leaks occur when God communicates. God enters verbally these earthen vessels. God enters verbally these earthen vessels. Let's just briefly review paragraph 5 of John of the Cross, book 1, chapter 5. All right. We're in paragraph 6 of that chapter. This was also indicated when God ordered Moses to climb to the top of the mountain. He did this that Moses might be able to speak to him. And then he commanded Moses not only to ascend alone and leave the children of Israel below, but to rule against the pasturing of beasts on the mountainside. The meaning is that the person ascending this mount of perfection to converse with God must not only renounce all things by leaving them at the bottom, but also restrict his appetites, the beasts, from pasturing on the mountainside, on things which are not purely God. For in God, or in the state of perfection, all appetites cease. Now, the sooner this mortification is achieved, the sooner the soul reaches the top. But until the appetites are eliminated, a person will not arrive, no matter how much virtue he practices. And we go on. Anyone desiring to climb to the summit of the mountain in order to become an altar for the offering of a sacrifice of pure love and praise and reverence to God must first accomplish these three tasks perfectly. First, he must cast out the strange gods, all alien affections and attachments. Second, through the habitual denial and repentance of these appetites, by the dark night of the senses, he must purify himself of their residue. And third, requisite for reaching the top of, the, of this high mount, is the change of garments. Talks about how he then attires, and they go on, he attires all the faculties with new supernatural abilities as a result of man's activities, once human, now become divine. That's very powerful. The only appetite God permits and wants in his dwelling place is the desire for perfect fulfillment of his law and the carrying of his cross. Scripture does not teach that God ordered anything else to be placed in the ark where, man, where the manna was. He wanted only the law and rod of Moses, signifying the cross, to be placed there. Okay, we have that. Now we're going to go into Exodus 34.3. You can read that for yourself. But God is now beginning to enter this verbal 
preferably earthen vessels and will be communicating to Moses. So he asks Moses, goes up a mountain. Here, effort is required. It's a harsh environment. There's thin air. What is the goal of Moses going up the mountain? The goal is to speak to God. Isn't this your goal in prayer? This is exactly the same goal that you have in prayer, to speak to God. There's three conditions. Go alone, leave the children of Israel behind, and no pasturing of beasts on the mountainside. Well, let me ask you something. Does Moses still love his family and his people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Moses still loves his family and his people. In fact, on the mountain, he pleads on behalf of them to God. This is not an act of an unconcerned man or an individual that is indifferent or one who has no cares about another. This is a man who loves his family, loves his people, and yet is going up the mountain. God is communicating to this earthen vessel. This is significant because here, love, because he here loves God very much and is communicating with God as you will in prayer. So you should know that one principle from this, underline it, underline it, underline it. Your relationship with God is not going to eliminate your love, care, and concern for your family and your community. Your most intense act of love generosity is your personal act of self-perfection. Moses is doing this, moving up the mountain, listening to God. Then, when you're self-perfected, you will intercede with God for loved ones in a significant way, as Moses did. So if you're troubled in your family, even the unborn generation or the culture troubles you, you can be like Moses, losing your appetites, being generous, filling up with God, going up that mountainside and God communicating to you substantially through prayer. You too will be able to intercede for others. That's the power of a generous heart. So God is now communicating to these earthen vessels. God has a problem, doesn't he? He wants to contain himself among his people. So God plugs the leaks of Israel. He plugs these leaks of Israel. And how does he do this? One moment. We're going to look and see. And we have it here. Paragraph 6. We have a striking figure of this in Genesis about this purification of the appetite. So the leaks are plugged. When, when the patriarch Jacob desired to ascend Mount Bethel to build an altar for the offering of sacrifice to God, he first orders his people to do three things. To destroy all strange gods, to purify themselves, and to change their garments. That's Genesis 35.2. So Jacob, prior to sending Mount Bethel, there's conditions that are set. Destroy strange gods. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. They're significant for three reasons. God speaks. Jacob hears, and Jacob responds. Again, God is speaking, Jacob hears, and Jacob responds. Communication is taking place. God is filling the earthen cistern. Isn't that beautiful? Reread that, Genesis 35, 2. Jacob, prior to sending Mount Bethel, conditions are set. God is speaking, Jacob hears, Jacob responds, the one cistern set aside for him, man, the human soul. God is desiring to fill that earthen cistern. But it's not enough to fill them because cisterns leak. The soul can spill out its contents to God. Cisterns leak. The soul can spill out its contents to God. So we've got Moses up the mountain. We've got Jacob up the mountain. God working, there is a solution. God desires an altar. God desires an altar on this mount. What is the purpose of an altar? The altar is sacrifice. Sacrifice for what reason? Because love is expressed. Exchange between man and God. This is the material required to leak-proof this earthen vessel receiving communication from God. We want to be altars of love. What was sacrificed in the Old Testament on the altars were the false gods of Egypt. You want to f sacrifice the idols that you may be having an appetite for, the false gods, on that altar. And you want 
to be as altars and transform into tabernacles. Do you see this? You're moving from the situation of an altar of sacrifice, sacrificing the false gods and false idols, losing your appetites for that which is not God, falsehoods, moving on to what is God, having a transformation, you becoming a tabernacle, an Ark of the Covenant where God, Christ resides, and the manna from heaven resides, the law, and you live by the cross, the, lo the laws of love and the laws of the cross perfect you and leak-proof you. All right, now we're continuing on. We're going to go deeper into this a little bit more. I want you to consider how we're dealing with Old Testament communication. It is verbal with words literally. It's a communication from God is verbal with words literally. But a precursor of the eventual communication of the word into the world filled with leaking earthen cisterns. This word was and is the substance of God, Christ. The Old Testament, we have the verbal communication of our Father. John of the Cross says that God spoke one word, and that word was Christ. What he's saying is God spoke substantially one word, because only Christ can communicate completely uh, and to the fullness of God's word, of God's communication. Remember, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. And John 1.1 1, 1 says that uh, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, this word is the skin, a word is the skin of an idea, an idea is a, a similitude of a reality. Christ has the fullness of the similitude of reality of the Trinity, of the Father, unlike anything else. So again, we have these verbal communications of God trying to, to fill our earthen cisterns that are leaking our soul. Finally, Christ comes into history. This word was and is the substance of God. The same flesh that appeared and Joseph seen and Mary touched, we receive in communion. Now, let's go into paragraph 7, part 1. Anyone desiring to climb to the summit of the mount must do three things. Again, this is John of the Cross, Ascent, book one, Ascent of Mount Carmel, book 1, chapter 5, paragraph 7, part 1. Anyone desiring to climb to the summit of the mount must do three things. Cast out all strange gods, all alien affections and attachments. Number 1. Number two, purify himself of their residue. Number three, change of garments. Transition from the virtues, which are our actions, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are God's actions. That's that transition. You act now. God acts then. That's what happens when you have that transition. That's part one. You can read it for yourself there. Paragraph seven, part two altar of the Ark of the Covenant was empty and hollow. And he goes into Exodus 27, 8. We're going to take open our Bible and we'll take a look at Exodus 27, 8. And here we have it. Exodus 27, 8. You shall make it hollow with boards as it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. This is the ark. I should say this is the altar. So God commanded that the altar of the Ark of the Covenant be empty and hollow to remind the soul how void all things God wishes it. How void of all things God wishes it. If it is to serve as his worthy dwelling. Okay, that it was forbidden that the altar have any strange fire or that its own go out. So much so that when Nadab and Abu, the sons of the high priest, offered strange fire on the Lord's altar, on our Lord's altar, God became angry and slew them there in front of the altar. That's in Leviticus 10, 1, 2. The lesson we derive here is that it is that a man's love for God must never fail nor be mixed with alien, alien loves if he wants to be a worthy altar of sacrifice. Okay? Now we have our conclusion in paragraph 8. God allows nothing else to dwell together with him. Consequently, in the first book of Kings, that when the Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant in a temple with their idol, the idol was hurled to the ground at the dawn of each day and broken in pieces. 
That's 1 Kings 5, 2 to 4. The only appetite God permits and wants in his dwelling place is the desire for the perfect fulfillment of his law and the carrying of his cross. Scripture does not teach that God ordered anything else to be placed in the ark when the manna, where the manna was. He wanted only the law and the rod of Moses, signifying the cross, to be placed there. A person who has no other goal than the perfect observance of God's law and the carrying of the cross of Christ will be a true ark, and he will bear within himself the real manna, which signifies God, when he possesses perfectly, without anything else, this law and this rod. That's the beauty to filling up with God and being more generous, even though we are earthen vessels, earthen cisterns. And that is the beauty of what can happen when your relationship with God, and that is the not a doctrine. And that is why we begin to operate in an area of mortification of our appetites, coming closer to God. And that may simply mean plugging up your appetites by avoiding overeating. Do not neglect your duties in life, your rule, even when it seems mechanical, legalistic. Uh, be more re diligent in rejecting evil and that which is not God. I think we've laid the foundation that none of this is inconsistent with embracing and loving your family. But I do want to answer the question, why do people not change and respond to this teaching? Some do, some do not. We find the answer, again, in scriptures. We have Mark 4.19. Let's take a look at Mark 4.19. But the cares of the world, and the delight in riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So remember, when they first hear the word of God, at the very beginning, they hear the word, and they want to respond to it. The word of God brings about that first conversion. And there's an impetus. They hear the word. They're excited. Uh, but they have these appetites for these other things. But the cares of the world and the delight in the riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. That's your appetites. That's your battleground. That's where you need to plug things up at. Let's go further. There's another reason why people don't respond to this teaching. And that's Isaiah 55. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose, and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Okay? Now, in Isaiah 55, it's an encouragement that if you are following the will of God to the best that you know, God will see that you prosper. God will see that things will be done, and you need only pray to him for that. You need only pray for understanding, for wisdom, that his operations take over. People don't do that. They rely on their own abilities. And God has already commanded that my word is not going to return to me empty. So shall my word be that it goes forth from my mouth. This, read and hear Christ. So shall Christ be that he goes forth from my mouth. And he shall not return to me empty. But shall he shall accomplish that which I propose. And prosper in things for which I sent him. Read Christ in there. Christ is the word of God. We are the body of Christ. We shall prosper to the degree that we have union with that body. We maintain that union in truth and goodness. All this comes together. I hope that's all making sense to you now. And in your discernment, try to dwell in that truth and goodness. Try to be faithful day to day to small things. Because by from the rubbing of two sticks, through friction, a spark, can go into a fire, and a fire can start off small and become a roaring forest fire. That's the product of sanctification. Okay? We're going to take a brief break. I'm going to get a drink of water, and we're going to go deeper into this formation uh, in the mind of Christ. We've been discussing plugging up our leaking cisterns in order to be more generous, to draw closer to God these habitual affections and attachments we've been working on. I want to just barely touch on the Dark Knight, uh, Book 2, Night of the Spirit, because this process of being detached, this process of purification, has a night of the senses, the work that you do. But to further verify, to further support the t concept that we must be detached, we have this second night of the sense I should say the second night of the Spirit. And it's the work that God does. So what you begin, 
as a result of the content that John of the Cross gives you. What you began, God finishes. Consider this. And regarding this second night of purification, the night of the senses, and this is an inflowing of God, the night of spirit can be seen as an inflowing of God into the soul, a passive infusion of love by means of infused contemplation. Only that the secret divine wisdom reveals to the soul its utter poverty and vileness. The very weakness of the soul cannot sustain the power of divine light. Suffering ensues from the clash of the divine light with human darkness. At this stage, the soul has a deep sense of unworthiness in God's presence. Like Job, it cries out, Have pity on me, at least you, my friends, for the hand of the Lord has touched me. And that's chapter 5, The Dark Night, book 2, Night of the Spirit. Let's go on. The substance of the soul, John of the Cross tells us. The divine light, he's talking about this continuing purification, this detachment of our appetites. The divine light now strips the soul of habitual affections and attachments. It attacks the very core and substance of the spirit until the soul feels that it is abandoned and perishing. The soul might now be compared to Jonah swallowed by the whale. Or again, its afflictions is described in the words of the psalmist, The lamentations of death encompass me. The pains of hell surrounded me. I cried out in my tribulation. The soul has a sense of being abandoned by all its friends and bereft of all comfort. It experiences a, it experiences a sense of wretchedness beyond all description. St. John compares its state to that of spiritual suffocation as when a person is suspended in air so that he cannot breathe. The intensity of this suffering resembles the process of fire consuming the rust of metal. As gold is purified in a crucible, so it is the soul is purified here. This is again chapter 6. It's referred to as like a purgatory on earth. There's much to be said if God in the night of the scent, in the, in the night of the spirit, is attempting to accomplish things. That's how important it is to plug up these leaks of attachments. And uh, it's beyond the scope of this level of tape to focus uh, any further on it. We can set, it, set up an entire series on that if there's a desire. But let's go back to encourage you to understand how beautiful it is that this can still be accomplished when you're still uh, working for God. Let's take a look at the angels again. We talked about how the angels are in union with God. The angels can serve God and the angels can uh, still have, uh, along with Moses, have a care and concern for the things of God's will. And that can be your family. That can be your loved ones. Let's see what happens here. We look, we're going to turn to St. Thomas Aquinas and learn a little bit about the angels, their actions, the angels' operations, and you'll see how it can be accomplished by God. Good things, and it'll encourage you. Now, I'm in St. Thomas Aquinas, and I just want to give you a certain encouragement to continue your purification process, continue plugging up your leaking cisterns by referring to the angels and showing you how beautiful this process is after it's completed. We're in the fifth article, part one, question 108 of the fifth article, and I'm looking at objection number five, and talks about, uh, St. Thomas Quine talks about the angels, he says, the name seraphim is derived from ardor, A-R-D-O-R, which pertains to charity, and the name cherubim from knowledge. Now, he then goes on and says, it is Holy Scripture wherein they are so named, for the name Seraphim is found in Isaiah. He's got down here 6, 2. And the name Cherubim from Ezekiel. He's got a little small i. And he's got CF 10, 15, and 20. Now, he then goes on in his discussions of angels. And he says that holy men are called gods by participation. Holy men are called gods by participation. Now, that's why you endure. That's why you fight. That's why you do this. Because God is going to participate in your operations to such an extent that, like St. Thomas Aquinas, holy men are called, holy men and women are called gods by participation. Not by, by nature, but by participation. Now let's talk about this participation in God that you're going to uh, uh, experience if you endure and if you plug up your leaks, if you plug up your appetites. And again, we're continuing in this Article 5. 
and St. Thomas's answer, and he gives us this. He tells us about the angels. We must consider that in the angelic order, all spiritual perfections are common to all the angels, and that all, and that they are all more excellently uh, in the superior than in the inferior angels. Further, as these perfections, as as in these perfections, there are grades. The superior perfection belongs to the superior orders as its property, whereas it belongs to the inferior by participation. He's saying that there's cascading orders of angels, that God's perfections are in these angels, and they cascade down. The higher angels have these perfections of God in greater degrees, greater order. The lower angels participate in these uh, spiritual perfections as they cascade down for you. If you think like a waterfall cascading down, at the top is the seraphim, then there's the cherubim, and at the bottom, receiving the fullness of God as it part in participation, are the angels. Now, the name seraphim does not come from charity only, but from the excess of charity expressed by the word ardor or love. He talks about this, and again, we're in uh, question 108, article 5, part 1. And he says, here, Dionysius expounds the name seraphim according to the properties of fire, containing an excess of heat. Now, in fire, we consider three things. Think of your soul. Think of the souls of your loved ones. Think of the souls of the great saints, St. Saint Teresa and St. John of the Cross. This is what an angel, a minister to the body of Christ, can have as it absorbs these perfections of God. Think how much your soul will look when it absorbs these perfections of God. Now, in fire, we must consider three things. He's describing what this uh, great seraphim looks like. First, the movement which is upwards and continuous. This signifies that they are born inflexibly towards God. Secondly, the active force which is heat, which is not found in fire simply, but exists in a certain sharpness as being of the most penetrating action in reaching even to the smallest things, and as it were, with superabundant fervor, whereby it is signified that action of these angels exercise powerfully upon those who are subject to them, rousing them to like fervor and cleansing them wholly by their heat. Thirdly, we consider in fire the quality of clarity or brightness, which signifies that these angels have in themselves an inextinguishable light, and that they also perfectly enlighten others. That's a seraph. It's an angel, a seraph. And that's what the elect also look like when they have filled up with the perfections of God because they've plugged their leaks, they have cisterns that don't leak, they've put their appetites, and they have only one appetite, and that's God and God's will. And that is how beautiful it is, like fire, continuously upward, looking inflexibly towards God to search for what His will is. Then they put out heat, you know, in their penetrating action is heat to the smallest, even to the smallest thing. And thirdly, there is a clarity or brightness to their activity, to their actions, to their functions that can penetrate. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it bright, and it signifies they have in themselves an inextinguishable light, and they also perfectly enlighten others. It's the same with you. You have children, you have family that have left the faith. There's crises. This is what you need. God is the remedy. Draw close to God, and you'll help even the unborn generations. Now, in the same way, we're going to talk about cherubim. This name, cherubim, comes from an ex certain excess of knowledge, hence it is interpreted fullness of knowledge, which Dionysius expounds in regard to four things, the perfect vision of God, the full reception of the divine light, their contemplation in God of the beauty of the divine order, and in regard to the fact that possessing this knowledge fully, they pour it forth copiously upon others. Now, cherubims have an excellence of knowledge and the seraphim, Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We'll try to uh, add to what was cut off there in a, uh, a more perfected second try. It's the best we have right now. This is our monastery moment to dwell on what we picked up and what we learned, what was new, what was old and was renewable.